Uh, let me turn this over to Mark McCarty, uh, who is from uh, the cathedral in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, she was the third president of the guild um, back in on the 5th, so did it back about 12 years, uh, or thereabouts. Huh? And then it was Bill Gleason, and then David Juddy, and then Margaret. Uh, and though she has stepped down uh, as the president of the Guild, she's still very active with us and uh, is a force to be reckoned with, and my job couldn't take place without her. So, Margaret, it's all yours. Those are some kind words, Duke. You are doing a fabulous job. So, first of all, I am delighted to be here. I see friends who have arrived since last night that I haven't had a chance to speak to. So, thank you. And the host committee, y'all have done a wonderful job. Thank you for this fabulous. <laughs> and our officers, Duke and uh, Diane Carlisle, I you know, Diane made three site visits to make sure everything was on and up and running smoothly before we got here. So thank you for that effort. Um, lots of hours of, of hard work. St. Paul's Cathedral is just a fabulous place and you're having us here again. I'll briefly digress and tell you that when I was the president in 2009, we were looking for a place to have the conference, something we always do. So we were looking for a place to have the conference, and we had several in the Northeast and the Southeast and the uh, Midwest. We hadn't had anything on the coast or in Southern California. So just out of the blue, I picked up the phone and called the verger at St. Paul's Cathedral, Brooke Smithson, and said, Hi, I'm Margaret McClarty from the Verger's Guild. Would y'all like to have a conference? And they rose to the occasion and said yes. So this is our second time back to St. Paul's. They have always risen to the occasion, been a wonderful, welcoming, and hospitable place. Uh, and that was a hugely successful conference in 2009. So we didn't blow it too badly, they let us come back. <laughs> um, you're here, you're a verger, you've been a verger. Who is currently serving actively as a verger in your church. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you for your ministry. Who has been a verger in their church less than three years? Okay, awesome, awesome. Well, welcome to the combat zone <laughs> in the church. Uh, at, at this time. Uh, one of the best things about this meeting is coming and enjoying our friendships that we've had. I can look around the room and see y'all are dear people. Um, how many of you every now and then just get a text on your phone that says, what kind of candle do you use for this? It's someone you haven't talked to in five years, but they know that you really like candles and they're going to you know, do you have a beeswax and oil fill candle? So, uh, I'd like to refer you to Virtual TV, Jay and Jenny, and I did a wonderful uh, video cast, podcast for that. Um, I mean, scholars call, text me and say, you know, what are you doing for this, or how did you get the new, or I text him, how did you get that incense so hot so quickly? Those, those kinds of things. Um, so, remember, we're a group, we love each other, we support each other, do not let those connections that you make here lay fallow, you know, between conferences. Um, so today we're going to ponder where we are and where we're going. I don't know about your church um, and, and what y'all have been going through, but we need to know, I kind of think, where we're going from here. Have y'all ever started to lead your procession? We're supposed to know where we're going. Every now and then I thought, I could turn left instead of turning right and see what everybody else would do. <laughs> I haven't done that. I don't have enough nerve to do that yet. So, since we're leading the procession, we've got to figure out where we're going. Uh, and I want us to use this session to share our insights, 
are not the challenges and successes of our ministry, what we've been working on against all odds. We have a backdrop of stunning challenges and change that's going on in the church. You know, beginning of 2000, uh, uh, 2020, we did not know that we would have a, a pandemic uh, where you had normal big services. I, I'll share my son was ordained to the priesthood. He was the first ordination right after the pan at the height of the pandemic. And he said, Mom, go do all your virtual stuff. And I did. We were allowed to have 10 people in the church at the time. So I was the virtual for 10 people for the ordination of my son. And um, by canon, we had to have that many people. We could have no more. Um, so, you know, we've all been dealing with a lot of these challenges that I've mentioned. Also, the, the, the pandemic now, you know, the cycle of you can do it, you can wear masks, not wear masks, wear masks, and, and that thing. Then we've had church affiliation. You know, culturally, you can you can read it. I I go to church. I, I'm a church goer, and I fully in the old days went at least three, but mostly four times a month. So if you're a church goer now, you go to church two or one time a month in all your parishes. Now I know y'all all go every Sunday. But, um, you know, the parishioners who think they are regular church attenders are only going one or two Sundays a month. Um, and so that's a challenge that we have. Uh, I don't know if, if you're experiencing, maybe you're in one of these fabulous locations that has, you know, all these wonderful people who, who show up in a robust, diverse congregation. Um, but a lot of churches are not experiencing that. So, uh, now I'm getting ready to ask, I've been doing some talking, and I'm getting ready to ask some questions. And I, I really want this to be an interactive session, and Scott is going to write up on the boards what's going on in the churches and what your experiences is. And this is an old-fashioned SWOT analysis, and so we're going to talk about things, and we either have a strength, bottom, opportunities or threats. And we're going to take these issues that we're going to talk about, experiences that you're having. Y'all are all experienced vergers. So we're going to talk about these. Um, the other thing I'll mention, you know, the, many of you I hope are well endowed parishes, but a lot of times, you know, every parish is only as, as healthy as the annual stewardship and the pledge. Uh, resources. Even if you are a well endowed parish, you need to have an active stewardship campaign uh, so people can give because they are giving out of their abundance, not their uh, because there's a project that needs to be done. And lastly, um, the, you know, we are such a welcoming and hospitable church, and I think the virgin represents that ministry of hospitality and welcome. But there are all the churches are, are having more and more experience. I, we just had a training in our parish about, you know, uh, the visitor who um, is disruptive or, uh, you know, is, is really coming just to ask for something that I really want to attend church. They just want to see if they can get raise some money and start asking parishioners or clergy for money. So we've got to figure out in, in a time of safety and security, how to be welcoming and hospitable. So that's a tension that we're in all the time. So now that I've asked these questions, what does being a virtue mean to you? That's a question. Hospitality. Hospitality, All right? Scott? Making sure everybody there is the one that show up. Okay. There's many studies out there about this and my personal uh gospel that we're gonna show up, so I'm gonna rotate and still in it the last minute. So the virgin has to is responsible for the service. The virgin has to um, which we all know, my favorite saying is if something goes wrong in the service, it's my fault. 
In other words, I didn't get it covered. So, uh, in that regard, what are you doing as a verger to help maintain or make sure that, you know, it happened this time, we can't help it, but it doesn't happen next time? Are we training more people to fill in as chalice bearers if our chalice bearer doesn't show up? You know, those types of things. <coughs> Yes. Yes. So organization. All right. So what else? Why is the virtue? Oh, yes. I thought she was bringing the microphone. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, they will serve the rector, the clergy, all of you, you know, not just on Sundays. I think you become more and more valuable the more that the clergy realize that you are there. Uh, and many of you have had this experience when you have a new clergy. The new clergy person comes in and just thinks the only thing you do is walk up and down the aisle. But my most recent dean didn't understand that the virtue was there to do all this other stuff. And after... She kept checking to see if the readings were marked and all that. And I went, we really do this. <laughs> you don't want to do it. You don't want us to do it. We won't. But so she understood she didn't have to do that. Yes. Uh, is this working? Oh, there it goes. Okay. Uh, one of the things I like to focus on is just kind of bringing joy to the, to the liturgy, especially to those who are serving. I think uh, some of us as vergers can focus sometimes too much on the logistics and the crossing the T's and dotting the I's, and are you where you need to be, and are you dressed properly, and those are all very important, of course, but uh, one of the things I always try to do when I'm serving uh, is to make sure everyone knows we're there to celebrate something beautiful and sacred and, and try and have a light heart and a, and a joy-filled attitude as we approach worship together. So. That's a, that's a wonderful insight. So not only to do our function, but to do it with the attitude of, of, of joy. Also, when we're talking about, you know, back to everybody's there, make sure everyone has a good attitude. I'm always sure to tell, like, either younger kids or anybody that's all going to mess up, and I'll just tell them, don't act like you've messed up, and you're the only one that, you and the preacher will be the only one that knows messed up. And there's never any mistakes that you should be worried about because they happen to everybody. And also, we may be doing it in a new way. They don't know it. Melinda, <laughs> let's. Yes, organizing the acolytes. Oh, organizing the acolytes. How many of you have direct responsibility over training acolytes? And, and, and uh, how, how many of you train chalice bearers and lectors? Recruitment and training. All right. My second goes on with what you were talking about. I'm um, back talking about it. Oh, um, my second goes on with what we're back talking about. And that's that um, communication just uh, between the clergy and the people that are in the serve, uh, in the serves along with the choir members, the chapel spares. But also, I turned to make sure that I think everybody who comes in and serves definitely that they did a good job because they do come on our actual world to spend time to help us. Mm -hmm. So in other words, making you you're the captain of the team and making sure you've recruited the people, you've trained them, and then by all means you thank them at the end. Um, and that's a real good point. David? Concerns me that at my parish church, it's a little different than everybody else because we're worshiping around all the furniture, everything is movable and heavy. So when weddings come in or certain cakes or even space to turn it out, I'm coming on a Sunday and nothing is in the correct place. And uh, here's my point though. The first time that happened, I uttered a four-letter word. <laughs> Not much reverberation there, 
started with sounds, but anyway. And then I started getting really upset. Now, I find the nearest person to help me. And I just say, we're going to get this done. We're, going to, we're just going to knock it down, and we're going to reset the church. <laughs> this is like a quarter of eight for a nine o'clock service. And that's a learning experience for me on how to deal with something that completely jars you. Put that aside. Let's get it done. Let's not worry, let's not worry about it. Let's just get it done. <laughs> I'm going to look for a plan. Everybody got that? That wedding party was really because they didn't want to reset the church. I would also echo what people have said already about planning, organizing, collaborating with clergy. But one thing we do in addition to those things and training the lay ministers is documenting to make sure that what we have established can be repeatable and just by others moving forward. The Berger's uh, website has a, a um, library, and in that library, we will be happy to take your manual, your acolyte manual, or your le lector's manual, and put it on the site. And I, I bet we haven't added anything to that library in a long time, but we would certainly invite you to send us what, what you're doing. That'd be great. Thank you. A, a quick point of order. Um, this is being recorded and will be put on Verger TV. Uh, the recording will not hear you if you don't wait for the microphone. Plus, not all of us here as well as some of the younger ones in here. Uh, and without the microphone, you don't get heard. But primarily for the recording purposes, please wait for a microphone. Thank you. Thank you. What younger ones? Another trait that I think is extremely important, I spent many a Sunday morning after the service in the courtyard, and uh, compassion and empathy in listening and to be with people. It's surprising. Um, and, uh, and also, I think, uh, what a beloved community is about is being with someone. So I think that's also one of those uh, skills and gifts that each of us as a verger and a member of a community can bring to enrich and be with members of the congregation. That's an excellent idea. I will tell you that personally, I do have on a cassette, but I do not put on my shamir or pick up my verge until I'm ready to walk down the aisle. So I am not standing around with one hand that I can't do anything with, all decked out. So uh, I, I really want to stress that I fully believe that humility is a part of what we do. And we cannot, I know we look good walking down the aisle, but you don't have to put on your Easter Sunday vestments every week. You know, uh, you can tone it down a little bit. Uh, that's the, the edge that I think gets us in trouble more than anything, is uh, that we are, look better and new clergy go, who's that person, you know? And so I think if we can just be, the reason I like wearing a cassock is because people know you're approachable. You know, if, if I had this dress on, nobody would come up and say, where's the bathroom? But if I have that cassock on, they'll say, I want to get a cup of coffee, where do I go? That kind of thing. So I think um, that's a real good point about being accessible. This is playing off of what he said about come in and things are in the wrong place, just fix it right. But you also need to know, well just from my own personal experience, I came in one Sunday morning, an hour before the service was going to start, and there had been, I, it had to have been during Lent last year, because you know there was one and then the next, a service one day, and the next day another service. Well, I came in and nothing had been reset. The community was still sitting up there. And there's no way the church was ready. So I, I took the set off of the altar and was just washing the things we would need for the next service. I didn't reset them. And the altar field 
head came in and she's like, nobody touches that except altar field. <laughs> so, you know, you have, it's right. If something's wrong, you've got to put it right. But you might have to humble yourself enough to apologize. I'm sorry, I was just trying to help. Yeah. The, um, so we're talking about great strengths of, of what we're doing. But we want to be really aware that uh, we're in a time, I think, am I overstating this? I mean, do y'all have challenges in your parish in terms of attendance? Who has a robust, who's back to full strength? No questions asked. That's great. That's good. Bless you. Congratulations, John, for a great job. Um, yeah, we do, we have online, we do all that, but you know, I'm talking about getting people in the pew and how, I, you know, what does it mean? And uh, I, I listen to, I mean, Trinity Wall Street has this wonderful program called DIV, Diocesan Vitality Initiative or something like that. And it's working on small parishes and making, you know, uh, uh, creating vitality there. There's a group called Tritank, or Tritank here, and, and they're doing a great job in terms of kind of jump starting. So if you have the chance, you know, read some of the articles about uh, what's going on in the church to kind of get us all back on our, on our uh, footing again. And I absolutely believe, absolutely, that the merger is significant in welcoming people into the church, making them feel comfortable, making sure that the service goes well, and thanking people at the end. And I, I tell you, that is a huge, huge uh, presence in the success of, of our parishes and, and our worship experience. And um, so what are you doing to recruit new vergers or new chalice bearers? I'll tell you what I do. I sit there with my little pad of paper and I look like, I, you know, there were a couple of vergers and I just said, we need more mergers because I'm getting older and I don't need to be doing this all the time. And other people, and one, I, even though I love doing it, I want to share that with other people. So I picked out somebody that had young children who could help recruit acolytes. I picked out someone who was, who was older, who would be a pastoral uh, relationship to older parishioners. So I, I picked out who the eight people were. and. I had to get and send a letter and inviting all those people to be virgins. And one of those fellows came up to me and he said, I got this letter from the dean. It says, John, we want to, want to invite you to consider the ministry of virgin. He said, your name is not anywhere in this letter, but your fingerprints are all over. <laughs> and that's what you do. You know, and I, and I said, I don't know how that happened. No, I said, of course you need to do it. You were one of my best acolytes 15 years ago. And he has a young son, so he can serve with his son. So those are the kinds of connections that I didn't want any acknowledgement for. It. I just wanted him to be a virtue in our church. And he is a very busy doctor, surgeon, and he... He's the first one to write and tell me when his call dates are, and he cannot serve those dates, but he can serve anything else. So, the, you know, just be insightful about who you're trying to get to help do the things that we need done. I'm going to second that um, invitation strategy. Uh, we've added a, another portion to it. It's certainly been at the ministry fair. There's a, there's a binder or a clipboard there, right? Because you sometimes don't know who is going to be feel feel called as well to be a verger. They may see somebody coming up and down the aisle and they're going to pass verger. So that's been sort of a two prong approach for us. We recently had two of our vergers head off to uh, OB or anyways. So we've got two really big holes to fill. But who's going to be that right fit inside the vesting room with the clergy that has the, the confidence? Um, to keep those conversations quiet, because that certainly does happen as well. You need the right person in the room. Um, but that two-pronged approach of pick who you think are going to be the right fit. Ask them if they feel called. But there are those people that feel called that just need 
that opening to find out and then discern based upon that after that fact. So I'm trying to get, uh, that's very helpful, I'm trying to get some uh, things that are helpful but things that are harmful. And I, I, I'll go ahead and say I think it's harmful if we think we are the merger. In other words, I think we need to be willing, a willingness to share. So not having a willingness to share I think is a harmful thing. Yes? I think that one of the things that falls in the realm of harmful has to do with the extent to which we do or do not make certain that those people who are participating in the service book in the congregation and on the altar, if they have a disability that's not obvious, if they're deaf or hard of hearing, if they have visual impairments, that kind of thing, to help our church or parish move toward having that be part of their mission of inclusion. Okay. So being fully aware of, of the talents and capabilities. Well, and what, what those individuals need. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Actually, I've been thinking a lot about a threat. Mm -hmm. And it's hard these days not to be in church especially a church like ours that's open 24 hours, seven days a week, without security. Um, in a very lovely neighborhood in the Berkshires. But nevertheless, there are folks that come through. And so I think of the time of Thomas Beckett, and that that is really part of our responsibility is to look out for the security of those who are in the church. Um, and it's just a reality, but it is a threat. And we're talking actively of how can you reduce that threat with security and, and cameras and presence and still remain an open church. I can remember 20 years ago we would never put cameras in the nave because we did not want to in, in, invade someone's privacy or prayer. And now we live, live stream everything and have cameras 24 hours a day. So we certainly changed. And to that point, we uh, do live stream our 1030 services here each week. And we have let everyone know that there is a certain corner of the church that is indeed off camera, and we make sure that it is never broadcast. So that's uh, another challenge to make sure that the people who are doing the streaming and broadcasting understand what your threats may be. <laughs> that's helpful. Uh, we did have uh, a security training, or we, we had both uh, two, two sets, CPR training, and we, you know, uh, offered it to all our uh, ushers, our greeters, and the vergers, and I wrote all of these new vergers a letter that said, you are the protector of the procession, that is your ancient charge, so you get there and learn how we're going to handle security threats in our church, and everyone is talking about, you know, the, the, the active shooter, which is like, the most remote thing that could possibly happen, but you still have to acknowledge that it, you might be the place that it might happen. Uh, so, but we had all of this other conversation, and even in our area, and I'm sure this is true of your area, uh, some of the churches in our area have, you know, ushers that are, they're not Episcopal churches, but they have people dressed in suits, and we all know who they are, and they have on navy blue blazers and a red tie. <laughs> And they're all packing heat in the church, you know. Um, and we went, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> uh, we're not going to do that. Um, but you still, so now we've decided uh, that all four corners, entrances to the nave, all the ushers, are, you know, if there's so many, there is a disturbance, the first thing you do is just go sit and welcome the person and talk to them. You know, you don't try to move anybody out. Moving someone out is in our, in our parish the last thing we do. Um, uh, and it only becomes like, if you go sit there by that person and then that, that person may get up and move someplace else and then you go get up and move with them. If, if they're being disruptive, if they're fine, you know, that's fine. But, um, you know, there are a few examples of people being a little unruly and having to be asked out. So I, have y'all done that type of training or uh, 
I'm just going to talk about a different kind of threat, at least that I think is a threat, is um, when we take ourselves and we take our work too seriously. Um, I train a lot of young acolytes and young vergers, and if I'm too rigid in how things have to happen, then they're not successful, right? You have to have this kind of way of training people, way of having a merger ministry where people don't fail. Mistakes can happen, but they're still successful, and so they can feel empowered to become, you know, the new generation of mergers in our church. And I have, like I said, I have a lot of younger ones, and the threat to me is if I'm too serious about it, if I'm too rigid, and those people don't have a successful first, second, third time as a merger, then they're not going to continue, and we won't have this continuing new generation of, of new vergers that come through. So I think that's important. Um, because our role is serious, but if it's so serious that it's inaccessible, then we won't continue. I, I love your line about people don't fail. They, a mistake can happen, but they don't fail. I like that. Wow. What other threats are there to our, our virtual ministry? Who gets burned out? Who's, you know, like I'm... Um, actually, I just, um, sorry, I just wanted to add something to the, uh, so the safety and security conversation. We had a situation this summer where we had a supply priest, um, and uh, so there's sort of like no one in charge except for the verger, and, which was not me or, or him and that Sunday, I was channels <laughs> and we got a tornado warning, and it was at that moment we realized we didn't have a plan. Um, but um, fortunately, the verge of that Sunday were, also works for the nursery school that's in the building. The nursery school that's in the building has a tornado plan. So we had to follow the nursery school's um, plan for severe weather um, and um, you know quickly decide what to do with the supply clergy, you know, sort of not being in charge because he was supplied. So I think like really being on, really like just like knowing what the emergency plans mm -hmm. are and be ready to, um, if needed, take charge. I think that's a great idea. Uh, and our safety committee is doing that. In other words, if, if Pat were to fall out on the floor right here, one person goes up and, and starts taking over. And, and the first thing that person says is, David, you call 911. And then they say, uh, you go get the uh, defibrillator machine, you know, uh, and then, then then we start working on Pat to make sure she's breathing, her airways are clear, you know, those types of things. So I, I think that's critically important to have that in place. So that, that's your health plan. Uh, we did have a person fall out in our church recently, and, um, you know, two doctors came up and started tending to the person, so we felt comfortable about that. But our configuration is such that a stretcher couldn't get to where that person was because there were these columns in the way. So now we've bought a real small stretcher that will fit around that column so we can get the person out and then on a hospital stretcher. But I, as the verger, my job was to run outside and flag the ambulance down to tell them the best way to get in the church on the ramp rather than have to come, go upstairs. So, you know, there are all sorts of little things that you can think about in that regard that, that are, would be very helpful for emergency training. I think one of the things that was hardest for me to learn, um, I'm a stubborn old dude, and um, I know I can do just about anything if I put my mind to it. Um, and it's like taking a two by four to get it beaten in my head that other people have ministries. And my job as a verger is to support that ministry, not to supplant it. Um, and that, yes, I can fix the altar front when it's not on right, but it's not my job to fix it. It's my job to go find the person whose ministry it is and allow them to do their ministries. Uh, and it, it took me a long time to finally realize that. Uh, and a big two by four, someone had to plan over my head. Uh, because if you fix it, time and time again, then they will say they don't need me anymore. And then you'll get not only to fix it, you'll get to put it on and fix it every time. Just 
in acolyte training, uh, we train them in case something happens during the service. And I've had two examples. One where a torch began to faint, and I eased her into the pew, took her torch, but the acolytes who were in the service, who were in the bay, in the pew, I knew one had to get up and replace. And she did. She got up quickly, vested, and by the time, this was near the gospel procession, by the way. Uh, the gospel was being read, the girl started to faint, and when she, when we moved her to the pew, another acolyte sitting in a pew immediately got up, vested, and joined the team. That's excellent. So they had to be, they all have to be prepared in case this happens. And it has happened twice <laughs> during a services. Oh, that's great. And I actually will tell you that I will, I'll tell the acolytes, not all of them, but I tell them the good ones, I say, if you need me to write you a college letter of recommendation, I would be glad to do so. Because, because I can say in that letter, you were creative, you knew how to react in the situation. I mean, you can really craft a very good letter of recommendation for someone, uh, for your acolytes. So, if you need to do that. Thank you. And that's a perfect example. Yeah. I was just going to mention that uh, in my parish, we require all of the Bergers, as well as ushers and others like that, uh, to go through the AE training so they know exactly what to do. And but everyone also goes through the uh, protecting our children, whatever the, the diocese. Right. So those kinds of things I, I think are, are certainly threats to be considered. That's excellent. Go through the proper training. All right, we, we touched burnout. Someone, only one of you admitted to burnout, I'd like to say. Is I'll just call it burnout. You want to tell us it? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, first of all, Margaret, thank you. Uh, my list is about 10 times bigger than that one. It's been a really good assessment, reminder of what we got at my parish, what's being covered, being covered well, by whom. Uh, I appreciate that with a lot of gratitude. Um, I think this kind of covers both the helpful and the threat. Uh, and, and look at the role that I play in my particular parish, which is working a lot with the acolytes and mentoring them. And you don't know who you're working with. Is it a future bishop? a future admiral, or the best garbage truck driver that the city's ever had. You don't know. And, um, and you want to get it right, you also want to keep it fun. Uh, that's important for them. Um, my first rector who got me involved with the um, Virgis Guild had been in Washington had the chance to do quite a bit of work at the Washington Cathedral. That's where he gained an appreciation for Vergers. And he wanted that for our church. And my current rector came from St. John the Divine, and before seminary ordination, she was a stage director in New York. So there's somebody who understands a live performance is collaborative. The interim director just didn't seem to know we could. We could um, be having an ordination. I have no idea what's going on. And we're 30 blocks north of our cathedral. Well, there was an opportunity to actually move my membership and be a much more active virgin in a parish that uses virgins and many virgins much more. And I decided, no, I really need to stay there for the acolytes. Because the new acolytes had seen me and my colleagues working with their older siblings. And the, the continuity, because for an adolescent, one or two years with an interim rector, you know, that acolyte that was 4'11", 
on the last rectors, last Sunday, is the same one that's 6-2 on the new rector. I mean, it's a huge amount of time. I felt to stick in there for, for the sake of continuity uh, for the acolytes. That, thank you very much. That's a great kind of, you know, on, on Christmas Eve, I'll be standing there, you know, holding extra wine or something, or, or, or extra wafers, and all the, all these <laughs> fine, great looking adults come by, and I think of them as little kids, and it takes, you know, words, they all come, hey, Mr. Clark, how you doing? How you doing? And I went, oh, um, you know, they're beautiful and they're tall and they're adults and they're out being pro uh, productive in the world and I, uh, it takes me a second to recognize them because and hopefully we do have a part in, in forming them and that's so important to us. All right, what other comments? Yes. The thing that we struggle the most with as a, as a smaller parish, not a cathedral, is Getting people to understand that virtue is a privilege and it's not a right because we've had several people that have wanted to be virtuers that didn't have the sense of being during the service to be calm and quiet and just drove the priest crazy. So we've had to be very careful in our selection process and not just having an open role that anyone can sign up for to, to be, because in our, being our, the size of the parish we are, pretty much most of our roles are wide open, but Berger is not. And that's, that's been the one threat we've had to be careful of. I, that's, that's great. We did, uh, our dean put, was going to put out a list. We're doing a reconnect uh, in our parish. We're calling, uh, all the best members are calling 15 people it doesn't matter, in alphabetical order. It doesn't matter whether you're coming all the time or not coming. Just saying, hey, in the fall, we're doing these things. You know, would you, uh, we want you to be aware of what's going on. And in it is a list of all the ministries that you could, or outreach programs you could be involved in. You know, just everything you could do, or um, Bible studies you can sign up for. And she had Verger on that list. And I said, oh, please take that off. You know. Advertise for chalice bearers, advertise for uh, readers, but please not virgins. And she said, oh yeah, she realized it was in time. Because every now and then someone will come up to me and say, I want to be a virgin. And I say, I'm just thrilled, I want you to be a virgin. Let's get you on the lector or the chalice bearer schedule first so you'll understand the workings in the name. And I said, Work, working up and down the aisle is only 10% of what we do. 90% of what we do is you know, set up, recruitment, making sure everything's right, solving problems. And until they understand that it's not the walking up and down the aisle, I said, you can't be, I, I don't say that, I say, it's better for you to understand what happens and how we do all this, so. Yes. I want to ask you. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I'm changing topics just a tad here. Somewhere on the harm, uh, and this is something each and every one of us face, is that Sunday morning is not the optimum worship for us. Uh, and I think in the harm category, is not being mindful of our own spiritual growth and our own uh, uh, tools for worship because our call is uh, does not allow us uh, to maximize uh, uh, the experience that we are called to bring to others in the community on a Sunday morning. I do know several virtues that have actually worshiped in different churches. I, I wanted to, to just, on what Margaret was saying about um, walking up and down the aisle is just part of it, right? It's just what we see. What I have found here at the cathedral, we've got a lot of weddings and funerals that uh, a lot of the people who come to those types of services are 
not church people. And that's where our practice every Sunday of, of merging people to the to the wedding. The pulpit's not that far away. You can find the pulpit, right? But when you don't know what you're doing, you start getting nervous, you don't know um, when, when should I get up, when should I walk over. When... And part of my job at a service like a wedding or a funeral, especially funerals, is to put the readers and the guests at ease. And I tell them prior to the service, you don't need to worry about when it's time to stand up and go and go read. I will come and get you. So you sit and you relax and you focus on your worship. I will come and get you. So all that that we do on Sundays, walking back and forth to the pulpit and everything, that's just practice for the times that we really need, when we are needed as a worker. That's an excellent point. I take all the lectures, you know, for funerals and, and weddings up to the pulpit ahead of time. And, you know, invariably it's some very distinguished person. You know, and I'll say, I understand that you're a TV commentator. <laughs> I understand that you're a federal judge, and you speak publicly all the time. You know, but let me say, in our space, it is helpful if you do this or you do this. And the the most accomplished people are the ones who appreciate that more often. In other words, I've, I've done that with presiding bishops before, and they say exactly where you do you want me to stand. And of course they do, because you know where the light is best, and you know where the microphone is on, and the people who are just out of seminary go, I got this, you know. <laughs> so anyway, don't do not hesitate to to you know say something that you think they already know in a kind and gentle way. Thirty years ago, I moved from the choir to finally becoming a chalice server, which I wanted to do for a long time. I got excellent training from the priest and the deacon in the parish. We didn't have a lot of acolytes. Uh, they are new on Sunday, whether they be an acolyte or not. So I also had to be trained to be an acolyte at the same time. And, you know, if I were there to serve chalice and there were no acolyte, I had to do all of the handing things and receiving things. I have a background in theater. I've I work a lot backstage and some on stage. And I don't get stage fright. You never saw a more nervous person in your life than my first Sunday serving the chapel. And yes, the, the lady who said some aren't suited to be virtues, that's true. I don't know how my parish put up with my first year or so of service, I mean, I tried so hard not to fidget. But, you know, it was fighting against all the anxiety that I, my parents had trained me to have and um, that I used to manage different things in my life. I'm just here to say we can be trained out of that. And, you know, to the gentleman who just spoke about compassion and, um, reassurance to people, um, realize that the volunteers that come to us are raw material. They're not the finished product. You know, nobody would have picked me out for ordination on that first Sunday when I was um, serving as a chalice bear. It was a step-by-step -step thing over 25 years. And, um, now I think I, I can handle most things without that nervousness, without, you know, starting up from my seat to say, who did that? Who dropped that? Why isn't there somebody to bring that in? But, you know, um, remember that as virgins, we can lift people a little step by a little step. And I'm remembering my first Episcopal parish, maybe 35 years ago, and there was a wonderful lady there that I only knew by reputation because she was gone by the time I was there. And you know what her ministry was? Every single Sunday after the service, she went to where the acolytes vested and she thanked each one personally by name and said, you did a good job. Didn't matter what they had done that day. 
You know, if they brought things into the back, maybe she still said they did a good job. And generations of Catholics remembered her. And that's what we need to do. Thank you. That, that is great, yes. The, um, yeah, people will always not remember what you said, but how you made them feel. And so, so that's very important that you find uh, include and welcome, and welcome these people. Yes. Oh, excuse me. One, one thing that I think we can help is when you get a new parish priest, for them to understand some of the traditions of the parish as they're trying to put their own spin on the parish. And explain to them some of the things that you've done traditionally and why. Yeah. And, and that's a, a great segue into a point I, I wanted to make also because the new rector, you know, they own the liturgical direction of the space and we always work, you know, and serve that person. And I've been in the church and I've served six deans now. And so I meet with them and have this conversation. You know, how do you want to prepare? You know, where do you want the gospel book? Before or after the deacon? You know, and all. Yeah. I mean, they all have their way they want to do it. And that's fine. Um, so is that exactly what you're saying? My situation is I'm not the oldest member of the parish, but I've been a member of the parish longer than anybody else. So mm -hmm. I have many years of experience there. And I think I do think it helps them uh, if you can tell the new uh, dean uh, or rector um, or vicar, you know what what works well in that parish and what people are expecting. But it doesn't have to be absolute. This is that you know that little dance that we have to do to to give information, but not say we're going to do it my way. Uh, now, the the one exception to that is the architecture of the parish. You know, the, the, where the rail is, where you're going to serve commercial, where the community, uh, where the wine is going to go. Uh, it, it, the old adage, the architecture always wins. I mean, we may want to try it a different way, but if you can't get to the floor with the chalice except going this way, then that's how you're going to go. So, um, you know, it's, it's a very intricate, that's where your skills are needed in conveying this information. Thing. There we go. I don't know where it falls on the on the chart. If it's a, a weakness, a threat, or an opportunity, but we as vergers are welcoming, right? And and how do we balance the welcome to other vergers who are curious that may not be the the right fit for certain aspects of being a verger? They might be totally capable of meeting the verger in the front of the procession to get from point A to point B, but not to, to stand next to the rector in the vesting room hearing all those other conversations. Um, and dividing that task into something that could be open and welcoming for somebody that's curious. Maybe they figure out how to be that right person in the vesting room or the, the caller presence by starting to be in the procession as a verger that's relatively straightforward unless you're uh, pretzeling around the sanctuary um, in, the, in the Great Litany, right? Um, but it, it kind of just comes to mind of we need to be welcoming into our own fold at the same time and, and how do we do that while balancing everything? I'm really interested to see where Scott's going to put this. Right. And, and I love, let me reiterate what you said, uh, uh, the word confidentiality. As vergers, we hear and see things that we can never repeat. You know? mm -hmm. Yes? This is part of hospitality. And I wanted to mention a subcategory of parishing that is um, intrusive. And they have people that arrive just for part of their, their chores. And I want to reach out to them. I know that the usher handed out a bulletin and said, welcome. But I want to reach out to them and offer chores 
because our cathedral has very historic, interesting things that they probably would completely miss. And they would have a kind of isolated experience uh, without being able to brag about their own church and tell me about their own church. And so I, I give them that opportunity after, after the service, and I listen to them, and then I show them all the interesting historic things. About That's a great them. idea. I've heard of other churches that they don't say sign the newcomer card, and, and, because a lot of people don't want to do that. I don't want to sign the newcomer card because I don't want to. But they'll say, come, well, if all the newcomers will come to the front of the church, we'll give you a tour. In other words, it's kind of a, you, you catch people that way, bringing in new but the, I love that. So you're willing to do a tour after the service? Yes. Uh, I'm very proud of my, my church and all the idiosyncrasies it has. And, and I, I love showing it off. That's great. Thank you. On a positive note, I would like to tell you an experience that I had in July. Our interim priest went on vacation for the whole month. So I had, I believe, five Sundays, if I can remember, uh, and I had a new priest almost every, a new supply priest every Sunday. And that was okay because one was almost 90, and I had served with him at another church, and so it was easy to work with him, but I had to watch him. And at the end of the, uh, to culminate what I'm saying, at the end of this service, on one Sunday, I was on the altar, finishing up, putting away everything, and one of the parishioners came up to me and she said, Patty, I want to tell you, I didn't realize how much you do. <laughs> and because I would walk with the priest, I would make sure they were on the lectern, I would walk with them, I would be with them on the altar pointing at things and bringing, you know, the gifts to them uh, from the side, and just whispering in their ear, this is what's next. Mm -hmm. and, and she said, I just I just really didn't realize it. So like we were saying, they see us walking down the aisle and sitting on the altar and amen. I think that's what the virtue does. And I said to her, now you know what a virtue does. But I work in the background. That's great. And quietly and humbly and just, just doing your job. You had someone over here. Yeah, one of, one of the things we instituted at our parish is called a seven-minute welcome. After the par after the service, anyone who wants to know more about our parish is welcome to come up by the baptismal pond to hear about our parish. And part of that is giving them a tour of the essential parts of the parish, of the church, like where the bathrooms are. And so that, we found, has alleviated a lot of the issues with new people. And I usually hang out up there with who's ever doing the seminar welcome, so they can point to me and give me any uh, direction. You know, like, if it's somebody we had recently visit us that became a part of the parish very quickly, but they wanted to be a child's bearer. They wanted to be, and I could be there to direct them in how to become a child's bearer, be, do this or do that, so that they can find the ministries that they wanted. So that, for our parents, it worked very well. Okay. Bring the microphone to you. I want to go back to something we started with. We talked about how today, for many of us, our average regular churchgoers are not every Sunday. Um, and certainly we have that in my small parish, and in small parish verging. <laughs> uh, it's me, there are no acolytes. Um, but one other task that I assist the priest with, because even though it's a small church and small attendance, it's hard to keep track of who had been seen and who hadn't been seen, because they don't come every week to begin with. So you have to consciously think about who hasn't been there. So another, another job, Verger's job, at least in my parish, is to help out with that pastoral care, not to do the outreach, maybe, if we have a relationship with that parishioner, to say, you know, call and say how are things going, but to at least inform the priest that you haven't seen somebody in a while to make sure that they're okay. I think that's an excellent 
Now, and, and to this point about church attendance, getting people in the building, and I may be wrong on this. Maybe they can be a good member and only come five times a year or something like that. But when we throw a parish party, there are hundreds of people at the parish party. It's off-site at somebody's house or, you know. I mean, I, I had a parish party at my house, and I live in a community with a security thing. I got busted. It's the only party I've ever had in my whole life where I was busted, but the guards came up to me and said, there are too many cars here. They're going all the way from the gate to here. We've got to get some people to move the cars. The parish party, I got busted. So anyway, <laughs> it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday. Um, so, but I, I think it's, we've got to be relevant, and I, I absolutely believe the verger is instrumental in, in building our worship, the worship experience, uh, to make sure that people come back to the building itself uh, periodically, more than just a random visit. Uh, and, and that's happening. It's just happening more slowly from my parish than it is in some. Uh, uh, do you have liturgy commission meetings in your church? Do, who, so we have a liturgy commission that meets once a month, and it's the altar guild, the flower guild, someone from the usher, someone who uh, scheduled the acolytes, the virtue, um, the choir master. So, uh, and we meet, and I will tell you, candidly, over the years, some deans have used this as their think tank for what if we did this? You know, would it be creative if we did this? Would it be inventive? Or, and then some people use it as just, oh, by the way, it's a checklist. We need acolytes on this day for this particular service. So I think that is a great resource that you could have in your parish. Um, you know, to, um, I'm all about incorporating more people in the parish to build the activities of the parish. I'll, I'll put a committee together for anything. You know, the security the training that we had, we're going to have a security committee now. I have five people sign up to be on the security committee. We have five people sign up on the stewardship committee, that kind of thing. I'm sorry. I think one of the things that uh, it falls in a weakness or a threat is that we all do this just as people, is prejudging people. And sometimes we have to be careful not to judge them because we think they're too old or they're too young. Someone, uh, the lady who led morning prayer, mentioned uh, disabilities, just because someone has a hearing disability, a sight disability, uh, perhaps they stutter. Uh, there's all these things that we encounter in our daily lives uh, that in one-on-one -on -one, we'll judge someone, and then something comes up at church and maybe they indicate that they might like to try doing it, and the first thing that might pop to your head is, I don't think they're going to be able to do that. Until you give them the chance and you find out the way you let them read the lessons, they don't stutter. They only stutter when they're talking to you one-on-one. -on -one. Or that just because they do use a cane, that doesn't mean that they can't walk up and down the steps and be a, a lamb or, or a reader or something like that. So I think that's and one of the biggest ways that was brought home in our church was we had, like so many of us, we have very few acolytes, but we have a set of grandkids of one of our parishioners and the youngest one at the time he started being a acolyte was six. Pretty young to be, to be an acolyte, but he was a torchbearer. And the next thing he said is, I want to read the lessons. And you know what? We let him. And oh my gosh, that six, now seven year old, he is a favorite of the entire congregation because he stands up there, he can barely see to the top of the lectern, and he reads the prayers of the people almost from memory. We have an extremely long list of people who are on our prayer list, and he stands there and he knows it. And it's just a delight. And I think a lot of us would have said, you're too young, wait a year or two. And it's been a joy for all of us. So my point is, don't rule anybody out. And at the other end of that is a lot of times we prejudge people. I think someone was mentioning like, well, captain of industry, we've got someone who's a, a business owner or whatever, I don't even give them, give them this kind of instruction. Guess what? They get told by somebody at work how to do everything all the time. 
don't think they're going to stand up and read it correctly until you tell them how you want it read. Everyone needs the same instruction, whether they're six or whether they're 60, whether they're the ditch digger or the owner of a big industry or something. We have to do everybody. And I think the other threat, the biggest threat, most of the we don't have a nice group of ages in here. The biggest threat at the Burgers is overall this age. Because so many of us are in churches with older people and people see it as us doing it. And when someone dies, someone nobody wants to pick up the sick and, and walk forward with it to do it. So I think we have to keep asking people to help us. I think that I've been waiting for someone to admit that we're all old. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and, all right, so who has a junior virtue program in their parish? Okay. All right. How do you do how do you do your junior virtue program? Uh, I start them all out as servers and acolytes first. So my um, my goal is that they learn all of the aspects of the liturgy first. So we have a training about you know what what happens in the service. You know we learn about the liturgy of the word and liturgy of the sacrament, and they do all of their roles. They serve as torch bearer. They serve as crucifer. They serve as the server. Um, and then they have some training on the be a lecturer. Um, and then at that point, once they kind of become competent in those skills that we start training as a verger. Um, and then they'll shadow with one of our adult vergers until they get to a place where they're competent enough to, to do things on their own. Um, and then we, we do try to work through the um, the guild training program with them when they get to a place where that's appropriate. That's excellent. Let's see, who else is here? All right, so we're, we're thinking about what, what we're going to do. We're learning a lot. We're hearing these wonderful experiences of other uh, of other churches, of our friends. Um, so we've decided we're going to grow our, min, our, our parish ministry. We're going to incorporate new virtues, share the wealth you've been enjoying it all this time. Uh, and I think... I think younger people, I think that's very helpful to, to bring in, in younger people. Um, the, I, I do want to have a general convention. I, I had the honor of being the platform master of ceremonies actually for several general conventions. And um, one of the readers we knew ahead of time was not going to show up. And so, uh, but it, it was someone that was representing one of the ministries. Uh, and I, so I just said, well, would you be, you know, your friend's not coming, would you read the lesson for us today? And he went, he thought, just took a minute and said, well, yes. Then he got up there, well, he stuttered. And none of us knew that. And he read the lesson and he stuttered. And it was the most powerful reading we've ever had at General Convention because everyone just, you know, just thought it was just fabulous. So, you know, it, it, miracles happen in those those things to occur. You know. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, then there was the time that uh, another reader didn't show up and I said, well, look, the, the Army Reserve is over there. I'll go get someone in uniform to read. So I go up to this guy and I say, sir, can you read our lesson for us? And, and he said, and he was a major, I said, major, can you read that lesson? And he turns around and his name is Ma Blessing. His last name, Major Blessing is reading our service. <laughs> So, um, wonderful experiences. All right, so we're going to grow our parish ministry. I mean, even if you're the only verger in a small parish, I think it's important to have a, a backup person. So you can take a weekend off and be here. Um, now, yes, sir. In uh, our congregation, uh, we were having a real problem uh, getting people uh, to the altar, and especially the clergy. Uh, and uh, so, oh, here, uh, just a year ago, we uh, re well, we instituted a very old concept. We went back to the Order of St. Vincent's, which I remember as a young acolyte. And we really expanded it so 
so many times you have people at an early service and people at a later service uh, or other ministries and they never get to know each other. And we initially started this to build community, as we have up there. Uh, and um, so in less than 12 months of uh, meeting together on, say, a quarterly basis, and talking about discernment and uh, other items, uh, we have netted one new merger and two postulates for the ministry. Okay. Which is right now, uh, I'm actually on their committees. Uh, so getting people together and, uh, in fact, I was very surprised at how many people wanted to join right off the bat. And uh, so that's one thing that we did in a rather smaller cathedral to uh, get people to think about that. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm going to back up a few minutes uh, to when the uh, lady was speaking about her acolyte pass, uh, passing out. What do you do when the virgin passes out? <laughs> no, seriously. Ten minutes before the service last October, I passed out of the sanctuary. I understand it's like pandemonium took place uh, when I finally uh, woke up with the EMTs. Uh, the priest was lucky enough to get someone to call the EMTs. But uh, the uh, Eucharistic minister that was working with me on the altar was outside holding me up. The organist had run into the sacristy when he heard. Uh, and it seemed that by the time she came with me to the hospital, they took the canter away from the organist and they got the uh, junior warden to come up on the altar and they wound up helping with the service. So we not only have to worry about you know, our congregation, if anyone is ill. We have to watch out when we become ill, which goes to the point of, you're right when you say, we need to find some younger blood to become the new virgins in our churches, whether it's a small church or a cathedral. So, so we're going to grow our parish support rate for, for the worship, which is going to help with hospitality, it's going to help with organization, recruitment and training, documentation and checklist, we're going to share all our ideas, we're going to send them to Duke and so we can put them on the Bircher Library on our website. And compassion, empathy, listening, and humility, those are our strengths on it. And we're going to use those to Get building networks. We have a chapter in our area. The Diocese of Mississippi has a chapter, and so once a year at general at our diocesan council, we all meet and specifically have a business session at that meeting. In years past, we've had a gathering in the summer at our uh, camp, uh, our diocesan camp, Red and Green, and, and that's been helpful. We haven't done that in a couple of years, so I'm challenging myself to, to kind of get something like that going to kind of reactivate our guild, you know, within this, uh, within the state. And many of you have chapters. Who, who has a chapter in your area? Okay, well, at least have a network of other virtues in your area, you know, just so you have a friend you can talk to. And it might be someone uh, that you do see at, at a diocesan council, you know, if you work on them those events. And then we're going to grow the guild. We do this very actively. We have a booth at General Convention. So if you're going to be around General Convention this time, you can uh, go and we do. We'll be glad to sign you up to, to work shifts at General Convention. Uh, it's funded, the 
the exhibit hall at Jama Convention is phenomenal. There are hundreds of booths. They sell books. They sell vestments. They sell musical instruments. They talk about our seminaries. I call it Episcopal Disney World because there are all of these different activities and things that you can do at Jama Convention. So it's really kind of fun. And People come by and give out information about the training course. You know, the training course is, is booming right now. Uh, so that activity is doing really well. So there are lots of things that the Guild is doing that you can get involved in in that regard. We've got a great board uh, that is active. Uh, they're always looking for people to help maybe write an article for the newsletter or, or you know, something that we can put out. Uh, so, uh, bits of news. I encourage every one of you to get a picture taken by Susan, our photographer, and I, last year I sent out a picture, Melinda and I appeared in the Mississippi Episcopalian attending the Virgins Conference. You know, <laughs> all it was was a picture of us in the neighborhood. We got a lot of press on that. So do whatever you can, and we were not in our vestments, we were in street clothes. In other words, I didn't want us all dressed up like little you know, velvet people. You know, I wanted us to be working and learning, you know, at, at this uh, conference. And then, so those are, I challenge you to grow your parish, to grow those, be in connection with the vergers around you, and then to help us grow the guild. The, um, and, and I remember, because this is what we do. What is our motto? Service in worship, and worship through service. So that is what we do, and I'm ready to have any closing remarks that y'all would like to make. <coughs> yeah, I, I just want to go back to something you said, and also something you said. Um, I was counseling another verger a few weeks ago whose rector had asked her to ask other people, or to figure out, you know, other people to become vergers, and she was mourning because she was no longer going to be the only verger, and she was um, feeling not important and throwawayable. And I was there 10 years ago. And so, as I sit now, we have six vergers at our church, and I wouldn't be here if there weren't vergers there who could serve in my absence. I wouldn't be able to go on vacation, but I think why it's important to have more than one verger is we all know how much we love what we do and we need to share that love. We, it doesn't lessen our importance. It just makes it broader. So just something to consider if you are the only verger, regardless of the size of your church, whether there's 12 people there on a Sunday or 1,200. Um, but having more than one verger is really, really empowering to your congregation. And it doesn't matter if we know, if, if anyone ever tells us that or not. In other words, we do it because we love to do it. Uh, we don't do it for praise. We don't do it you know, for any other reason. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm, this is immodest to say, but uh, we're among friends here. Uh, I do the ordinations all the time. And so one, this last time, I couldn't be at the ordination. I had to be out of town. And so, someone told me, they said, one of the priests, they said, don't ever let us do one of these ordinations if Margaret's not here again. All right. He didn't, the bishop didn't come tell me that. None of the clergy came and told me that, but it filtered back. I didn't go say, you didn't tell me this. I just went, okay, that was good. And that's the kind of stuff, support, that you'll get all the time. You may not hear it, but what we, um, what was our, re our reading last night? Be humble and pray in secret, and you will be rewarded in secret. I think uh, one of our strengths is this conference, and it's such a wonderful time to share uh, stories about doing what we love, to share problems that we've had and how they have been addressed. And I would, um, I'm just so blessed to be here and thankful, and thank you all for putting this together. And I'd also like to make a plug for a central hotel, which would maximize our time together at meals, at um, 
coming up in an elevator to your room, and, and uh, I miss that. So just for what that's worth, if you would consider that for years to come, thank you. Okay. I am being a good verger. I'm going to get y'all out at 10:30. That's so. <laughs> because okay, that's what we're supposed to do. Be on time. That's good. And y'all notice this is the only group I've ever been in where everyone is always on time. So you better be careful. The next, the next conference host, not only will they show up on time, they'll be there 30 minutes early. So anyway, Scott, I want to thank you for being our scribe. We will, we will, these are great notes, I encourage you, um, we'll, we'll publish this information, but um, it's great notes. Thank you, thank you for your ministry, I am indebted to you for being here, thank you.